Martin Luther King was assassinated on April 4, 1968. His alleged assassin, James Earl Ray, remains in a Tennessee prison serving time for previous offenses. He has never faced trial for the murder of King. Lawyer, author, and activist Mark Lane is Ray's attorney, and for the last 21 years has investigated the case and tried to bring it to court. Pacifica correspondent Charles Bell interviewed Lane in April of 1989 about his involvement with James Earl Ray and the evidence he has uncovered. At the request of a number of black leaders who felt that putting James Earl Ray away without a trial was an effort by the United States government to hide the facts from the American people. At their request, including Jesse Jackson and Ralph Abernathy and other black leaders, I met with James Earl Ray and tried to get for him a trial, because that trial would have focused the attention of the American people on the facts for the first time, on the facts surrounding the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, I moved to Memphis met with uh, Mr. Ray, met with judges down there. Uh, Ray was actually entitled to a trial. He never had that trial. He had been represented just before the trial by uh, Mr. Haynes and his son, Mr. Haynes, two lawyers who were prepared to try that case. The government somehow insinuated Percy Foreman into that jail cell just before the trial was to take place. Mr. Foreman... Uh, did a terrific salesman job on behalf of himself, convincing James Earl Ray that his lawyers were going to sell him out and that he, Percy Foreman, was the one person in the world who could save James Earl Ray. Uh, Ray, it should be pointed out, had been kept in a cell specially designed for him 24 hours a day in that cell with lights on him 24 hours a day with cameras focused on him. He suffered from sensory deprivation. He was watched 24 hours a day by guards. One of the guards told me the place was so sensitive he could hear a cockroach walk across the concrete floor. Ray was in that condition, and he agreed to have Percy Foreman represent him. As soon as Percy Foreman represented him, the judge said, well, Mr. Ray, you could have Foreman, but you can never change lawyers again. And Ray said, that's okay. And then Foreman went back to the cell with James Earl Ray and said to him, I'm pleading you guilty. If you don't plead guilty, I'm going to tell the jury I believe you're guilty. And then an FBI agent came in and said to Ray, your father escaped from a prison 50 years ago. We know where he is. He's an old man now. We'll pick him up. He'll die in prison unless you plead guilty. With all this pressure, Ray pleaded guilty but did say to the trial court there had been a conspiracy. When Ray was sentenced to uh, 99 years in prison, he immediately was removed from this 24-hour surveillance, had the first good night's sleep in eight months, woke up in the morning and wrote a letter to the trial judge, Judge Battle, and said, I was coerced and in essence tortured into entering that plea of guilty. I want a trial. The judge went on vacation to Miami. When he came back, he picked up Ray's letter, read it, and dropped dead, literally dropped dead on that letter. Now, under the provisions of the Tennessee Code annotated, Mr. Ray was entitled to a new trial because there's a provision which says it's known uh, by people in prison as the jackpot provision, and that is if you make an application for a new trial and the judge dies or becomes incurably insane before he rules on it, then uh, it is automatically granted. Ray was entitled to a new trial. After that, I got into the picture, tried to get that new trial for him. Judges throughout Memphis, throughout Tennessee, said to me, you're right, he's entitled to a new trial. Please do not bring it before me. We cannot give him a new trial. There's just too much pressure. He cannot have a trial. And neither James or Ray nor the American people have had which, that which we are all entitled to, a trial which would expose all of the facts surrounding the death of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, could we go back for a moment for, after all, we're talking about uh, something that happened 21 years ago, and many of our listeners may not be familiar with the exact details. Could you briefly outline the circumstances of Dr. King's death and how the finger got pointed at uh, James Earl Ray and how he was subsequently uh, caught? Dr. King had been to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, to assist in the demonstration by 
the union of uh, garbage employees, garbage collector employees, almost all of whom were black. And uh, he was also building at that time a Poor People's March on Washington. This Poor People's Campaign was going to bring tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people here to Washington, D.C., for the purpose of remaining in the city, camping out, and staying here until the economic system of America was changed. Dr. King said that what is required is justice requires that the economic system be changed so that we do not have so many poor people, so many homeless people, so many desperate people, people without hope, while there are so many multimillionaires and other wealthy people in this country, and we must address the system and change the system. In the middle of all of this, Dr. King was called to Memphis by the Union of the Garbage Employees. He went down there and had planned to stay at the Holiday Inn Rivermont. Now, it was at this time that the Federal Bureau of Investigation had embarked, had been embarked for some time, upon a campaign to destroy Dr. King. In fact, in the Atlanta, Georgia office of the FBI was a group called the Destroy King Squad. I interviewed Arthur Murtaugh, special agent of the FBI, who gave me a great deal of information about how they operated. But their job was to destroy Martin Luther King. And when it became clear that Dr. King was going to Memphis, they pulled out all of the stops. They did not want Dr. King in the Holiday Inn Rivermont. The Holiday Inn Rivermont is a tall building outside of the downtown area. Once you're in that lobby, you're, you are secure on your way up to your room and, and you're safe in the room. They wanted him at the Lorraine Motel, a small little motel built sort of like a shooting gallery. It was a perfect place. The FBI utilized its contacts in the media and uh, in Memphis and elsewhere, and they started a campaign with documents written by the Federal Bureau of Investigation agents saying, why is Dr. King going to stay at the uh, Holiday Inn Rivermont? It's a luxury hotel owned by white people. If he's such a crusader, why doesn't he stay in the Lorraine Motel? They even picked out the place. The Lorraine Motel owned by Negroes, a uh, perfectly respectable motel. Why doesn't he stay there? Andy Young and others in charge of Dr. King's uh, Accommodations in Memphis called Dr. King and said, what are we going to do about this? And Dr. King laughed and said, well, we, when we go down south, we always stay in these previously segregated facilities. That's how we break down segregation. But his advisors down there in Memphis felt that the pressure was so great that they better move him out of the Holiday in Rivermont into the Rain Motel, and that's where he went. Now, Dr. King... Wherever he went was followed by agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation for years, years. They never let him out of their sight. In fact, when Dr. King was given the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize and went to Oslo, Norway, to accept it, on the plane with him were FBI agents. When he checked into a hotel in Oslo, there were FBI agents in the next room, and they were bugging his room, and they were bugging his telephone. He was never out of their sight. Moments before Dr. King was murdered, on April 4, 1968, all FBI surveillance was withdrawn, moments before. In addition to that, the local police, the Memphis police, had assigned every time Dr. King came to town, the same officer, Ed Reddit, a black police officer, to provide security and surveillance of Dr. King, and he was in charge of the squad that day. Uh, however, there was a new, new development in Memphis, and that is that a new man had taken over. His name was Frank Holloman, who had left the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, Frank Holloman had been the uh, officer of the FBI who personally ran J. Edgar Hoover's office in Washington, D.C. for Mr. Hoover. He left and became almost immediately the director of fire and police in Memphis, Tennessee. The only thing he did on April 4, 1968, and the day before, was to tell Ed Reddit, the black police officer in charge of surveillance of Dr. King, that he should not be in charge of surveillance. He should go home, that there was a death threat against him. And Ed Reddit was practically placed under house arrest by other police officers, white police officers, and forced to go home. There were two other blacks on the scene, however, 
right across the street from the Lorraine Motel, were two black activists. One of them, Floyd Newsom, a really active supporter of Dr. King. He was a fireman, and the other black man was also a fireman. Now, Mr. Holloman, as director of fire and police, the first man ever to be director of both organizations at the same time in Memphis history, uh, he sent the two black firemen out of that firehouse and told them to report on April 4th to another fire station miles away. They were needed in that fire station from which they left, from which they were sent, and they were surplus employees at the fire station to which they were sent. What Frank Holloman had succeeded in doing was removing any black activist in the fire department or the police department who would have been on the scene when Dr. King was shot. That was done moments later. One shot was fired. Dr. King was killed. Now, uh, Dr. King was killed just after 6 p.m., is that correct? Now, <clears throat> how did the uh, finger get pointed at... Um, uh, James Earl Ray, and who or what was someone by the name of Eric Starvo Gull? Well, uh, that was the name that Ray had used, but uh, it's hard to know exactly how the finger got pointed at James Earl Ray because uh, Ray was uh, in the general area. Ray was known, I believe, to those who killed Dr. King long before the shot was fired. I believe that the evidence shows that, in fact, James Earl Ray was broken out of the penitentiary in Jefferson City, Missouri, by those who later were involved in the plot to kill Dr. King, and were probably involved in the plot to kill Dr. King when they broke him out of the penitentiary. What, what was he in the penitentiary for at that time? He'd been involved in a number of small crimes. Remember, James O. Ray had spent a lot of time in prison for a lot of little crimes, had never been charged, not only never convicted, never been charged with a single act of violence in his whole life, had never even been involved in a fight that anyone knows of. He was a totally nonviolent, bumbling, small-time criminal. They broke him out of the Jefferson, uh, Missouri penitentiary and uh, surrounded him, talked to him on one occasion or another, and got him involved in doing little things, bringing cars into the United States, and finally told him that what he desired most, he moved, he went to Canada, but they brought him back to the United States. What he desired most was a passport to get him to Europe and a few dollars so that he would never have to come back because he faced uh, more years in jail in Missouri plus an additional five years for escape. He was a perfect rabbit. If he was charged, for example, with jaywalking, he would have to flee instead of face the charge because it's not the jaywalking which would be the problem, but once he was back in the hands of authorities, he might spend the rest of his life in prison for escaping and for what he was in jail for in the first time. So he was the rabbit who would run. He was perfect from the viewpoint of those who wanted to fix blame on him. Finally, he was met by a group of, by an individual who said, I'll give you a passport and a lot of money. You can go to Europe and never come back, but I want you to pick up a rifle and we want to show it to some people because a group is going to come into Memphis and look at rifles. If they like them, we'll buy more. Give them to these rifles. This is for some revolutionaries or something in Latin America, and they will give us large sums of money, and I will get you a passport from that money. Ray thought this was his ticket out. He got a rifle, he brought it to Memphis, Tennessee, he checked into the rooming house with the rifle, met with his friend Raul there, and then Raul said, well, they, these guys don't want to see you, so you just stay out of the building, go out to your car, but, but don't drive it around, just walk around, and then come on back a little later. They were setting Ray up. Ray, however, looked at the car and realized it was short of gas, and decided that it was a fast getaway after they made the deal, it would be better, his friend Raul would be more appreciative if he filled the car with gas. He drove away to fill the car with gas, and at that time, a shot was fired which killed Dr. King. Now, there was one witness, one witness, who actually saw the killer come out of the bathroom from which the shot had been fired. Her name was Grace Walden, or Grace Stevens. She lived with a man named Charlie Stevens. And uh, she, this is a statement that she made at the time. She was questioned by reporters. People came over to the building when they, it was determined the shot had come to the bathroom. She said, I was here in my apartment, my room, which is right next to this common bathroom on the second floor. And while I was here, she said, Charlie, who had been drinking a lot of beer, started banging on the bathroom door and said, I want to get in. I was in there. And the person, whoever it was, it turns out it was the killer of Dr. King, did not answer. Charlie became furious, kicked at the door, and then Charlie finally 
he'd been drunk, stumbled down the stairs, went in the backyard, and started to urinate outside. At that time, a shot was fired. Grace Stevens looked through her open door as a man came out of the bathroom. She described the man later. He was carrying something in his hand, and he went down the stairs. She is the only witness in the world who saw the killer as he left the area. But later, when shown pictures of James O. Ray, she said it was not that person. In any event, after Ray was picked up in London, in the airport, the Heathrow Airport, and brought back, they wanted to bring him back to the United States. But because there was a treaty between the United States and England, an extradition treaty, which states that probable cause must be proven before England will extradite anyone, they needed some evidence against Ray. They had no evidence. So they went to see Grace Walden Stevens and said, you're the only person in the world who saw him do something for your country. Just sign this affidavit saying he's the person. She said, you have a picture of him? And they showed her a picture of James O'Ray. She said, how old is he? How tall is he? Etc." She said, well, I want to tell you something. This is not the person I saw. The person I saw is at least 10 years older, is much shorter, doesn't look anything like this man at all, nothing. And they threatened her. Then they offered her a $100,000 reward if she would sign. She said, I can't. It's not the right man. Later, they came to her house. They were furious at her. They came to her apartment, picked her up, and illegally threw her in a mental institution in Bolivar, Tennessee, where she remained for 10 years until I got her out. In the meantime, they went back and they saw Charlie Stevens. Now, remember, Charlie Stevens was outside of the building. He was urinating. He was drunk, and he never saw the man. Charlie Stevens signed an affidavit saying, yes, James O. Ray is the man I saw that day, and that's how Ray was executed. That's the entire case against James O. Ray. The statement, an affidavit signed with the promise of $100,000 to Mr. Stevens, signed by Mr. Stevens, who was both drunk and in a situation, a position where he could not even see who came out of the bathroom. When I found out about this, years later, that Grace Walden was the witness, I went to the mental institution and I talked with her, and she told me exactly what I told you. I tape recorded. Then they tried to arrest me, the state authorities, because I had that tape. And uh, we started a campaign then, and we were finally able to get her into a halfway house. And I took her from that halfway house, and with her request, to California where there were FBI agents waiting uh, to arrest us when we touched down in Los Angeles for, I don't know what charge, but Donald Freed and other activists on the West Coast had assembled a group of about 200 people at the airport, and they realized this would not be a small thing, and uh, decided not even to question us, and that's how Grace Walden escaped. However, uh, her words uh, have been heard, but uh, not by the authorities in Tennessee. James Ray remains in prison. The only evidence against him remains an affidavit signed by uh, Mr. Stevens, who was induced to sign that by an offer of $100,000 from the FBI, and also with the understanding that Grace well, Stevens, the woman he had lived with, was in a mental institution as punishment for not having signed a similar affidavit. Did Mr. Stevens collect his 100000 by the way? No, he, that's interesting. He got a lawyer to collect the $100,000 for him, and the... Uh, the authorities, the court, refused to give him the $100,000. To this day, when last I looked at that, which was 15 years after the event, that court record was sealed as if there's some big national security question involved, like an atomic weapon question. That document, maybe it is, that document has been sealed, and no one can see the court record to find out why they denied him the money, but they did deny him the money. They obviously took the position. He didn't see anything. He didn't know anything, but they don't want the rest of the American people to know that because that's the entire case against Mr. Ray. In addition to the, uh, uh, to the possibility that Charlie Stevens uh, isn't a very reliable witness, uh, were there also witnesses who saw Ray at the gas station where he was filling up the car with gas just at the, about the time of the assassination? We don't want trials. 
We have Yasser was shot to death in the basement of the Gospels in court building before he could be tried. You can't do that all the time. People might get suspicious. So in the case of James O'Reilly, the idea, since he was going to be the rabbit who would run, was to let him run. I mean, here we have a man in a white Mustang, and minutes after the, the death of Dr. King, the whole country, the whole world knows this event has taken place. Well, they have to seal off a few of the roads around Memphis, and there's no way for a way to escape. Instead, the Memphis Police Department broadcast a phony chase of a car. The radio tape is still available, as a matter of fact. Of a phony chase of a car going in the opposite direction. And based upon that phony story, all the cars went in that direction. The police cars to try to seal off the wrong area while Ray drove peacefully up to Atlanta in a white Mustang, a really easily identifiable car, and was never stopped. And Ray was then allowed to leave the country and never stopped. And Ray was not going to be brought back. Remember, it was not the FBI or the CIA or the Memphis police or the Texas Rangers who located James O. Ray. It was Scotland Yard. They found him at Hitro, and uh, he was then embarrassed in the United States government because they never wanted him back. But once he was caught, they had to make go through the effort of getting him back and then preventing the trial from taking place in a new fashion. Uh, can't keep on, as I say, killing the alleged assassin, and that's what they did. Ray was allowed to escape, but when he was caught by the British authorities, he was brought back, and then a new method was engineered to prevent him ever from being tried. Now, uh, a number of uh, prominent people, you mentioned Jack Anderson, uh, you yourself are a prominent person, have uh, raised some serious questions about this whole case. You mentioned also that there are numerous witnesses who can testify to one or another strange aspect of the case, everything from the police officer who was taken off uh, uh, to the uh, taxi driver and so on. Also, items of physical evidence, such as the tape you mentioned. Now, with all of these things uh, and all of these people out there available, is there some mechanism by which Ray can uh, can can get a, a retrial, or is this simply a matter of historical speculation that will never never come to light? Well, there's a mechanism, but it takes a brave judge in Tennessee. Do you know any? Uh, I'm not familiar you? with Tennessee judges, but uh, is there not one? Well, there may be one. I don't know of any. We've made these applications, and the courts have been uh, reluctant to put it mildly. Hysterical is more accurate uh, uh, to prevent this from happening, even to prevent the case from being presented to them. And this is, this is the problem. The problem is that the facts are there, as Dr. King gave his life to struggle for justice, and in the last days to struggle for a change in the economic system, we have to all of us commit ourselves, I think, to uh, a movement in this country so that there can be justice for James O'Reilly and for all the other people in prison who don't belong there, who are victims of uh, a traditional lack of justice in this country for those who become active in trying to change things, or who are swept up in events which are bigger than themselves, events which they never really fully comprehend. That's what's required now, the American people speaking out on this question. Could you suggest, in conclusion, what action uh, the listeners to this station might take, if there is any that they could take, in the specific matter of trying to get an open trial for James L. Ray? I suppose at this point, if there were a letter-writing campaign to the governor of Tennessee saying, we want a trial for James L. Ray, if that became a national campaign issue, I suppose uh, there would be a, a trial. And remember, that trial is not only one which James Earl Ray is entitled to, having spent all of these years in jail for crime, which the evidence demonstrates he did not commit, but that trial is one to which the American people are entitled so that we can learn something about who killed Dr. King. James Earl Ray is in the position of Lee Harvey Oswald, and that is denied a trial. In Oswald's case, it was important to kill him, to silence him, so that could, there could never be a trial, because a trial would have demonstrated that he, Oswald, was not the lone assassin of uh, President Kennedy, in fact, was not involved knowingly in any way. A trial of James Earl Ray, resulting in an acquittal, would demonstrate to the American people that some persons were involved in the uh, assassination of Dr. King and might focus attention, finally, on trying to find out 
who they are and if they operate in the United States today and if they operate in the United States government today. You have been listening to an interview with Mark Lane, activist, author, and attorney for James Earl Ray, the accused assassin of Martin Luther King. The interviewer was Charles Bell. The interview was conducted in April of 1989. This program is distributed by the Pacifica Radio Archive. For copies, contact the Pacifica Radio Archive at Box 8092, Universal City, California, 91608. That's Box 8092, Universal City, 91608. To order by credit card, call 800-735-0230. That's 800-735-0230.